1 John 1, 9 explains that when, as a believer, someone who's saved and secure in Christ, that personal sins, mental, verbal, overt sins, are confessed to the Father privately, silently, and this cleanses you from, and our study is cleansing, it cleanses you from personal sin and allows the Spirit to be back in charge of your life, to, to be the teacher. So take a moment, look at your life, tell God what's going on with you, where you are, and let's pray and study. Well, Father, we're grateful that the Word has been left to us to understand your plan for our life and how we fit into this whole big picture of the angelic war and how it all fits into the political scheme and the military scheme and the historical and all the things that go on. And I pray tonight that you give us an understanding of what goes on between you and I, between the believer and the spirit as spiritual growth is happening that that as there's a purification taking place and you're intent and determined to free us from many things that hold us back from being able to love you as we do and to love others so i pray you'll help us understand that tonight in christ's name amen uh, last week we talked about paul in his trip to jerusalem out of acts chapter 21 he went into reversionism somewhere along the way and decided to stop obeying God. And even, you see, there was a time in Paul's life when he heard the Spirit, don't go here, but go there. But now he's shut the Spirit out within himself and God has to send individuals and even give him visual aids and still he won't listen. He's determined to go to Jerusalem to, in my opinion, get his needs met, his need for recognition and his need to belong in this group to be praised. It's just normal stuff. Listen, these are not wrong needs. It's how we go about getting them met. If you've ever had children or grandchildren, you see this is in every child, this need to be loved, to be to be accepted, to be praised. It's just part of our nature. It's the way God made us. But getting those needs met the right way is really a lot of what life's about. When we start off in life, we don't do that. So let's talk. If you want to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it's on your page there. Uh, we'll use that as one of our key verses. He says, therefore, having these promises, and, and we'll look at it in a minute, the promises are about fellowship and intimacy with the Father. Let us cleanse ourselves, purify ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we have this one side, we have our motive, we have the motive of the promises of God, we have the cleansing aspect, and then we have the perfecting aspect of, of growing. So let me just lay out some principles here to start with, and we'll get to some meat. First of all, purification and sanctification are two sides of the same coin. I know you've heard the word sanctify or sanctification. Purification is cleansing from what's bad, and sanctification is the imputation of divine righteousness. It's being made holy. To be sanctified means to be made holy. So we're cleansed on the one side, and we're made holy on the other. So like all aspects of the Christian life, this comes in three phases. The first phase has to do with salvation, and this is called positional sanctification or positional cleansing. Uh, like Titus 3.5, the, you know, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration through the Holy Spirit. There's a washing that takes place 
at our salvation, a cleansing. <clears throat> and this is a cleansing, which is the same as similar. It's the other side of the coin of sanctification. It's the breaking of our positional uh, uh, corruption. This judicial, cor a judicial corruption that God sees in us that's part of Adam's sin. We're cleansed from that in the eyes of God. Experientially, it remains in us. We still function in it. But positionally, we're cleansed. So the first phase is positional. Second is practical. Like Ephesians 2, 25, 26, uh, Jesus talks about, uh, Paul is explaining the relationship of Christ to the church, and he's using marriage. And he says Christ is determined to present the church to God the Father, having cleansed us by the washing of the water of the word that he might sanctify us. Cleansing and sanctification go together. They're two sides of the same idea. Then there's permanent cleansing or sanctification, and that's 1 Corinthians 15 where you have a perishable body, a corrupt body, a body of sin, Paul calls it a body of death. And you exchange it for a spiritual body, one that's perfect, one that's immortal. So purification is a part of every aspect of the Christian life, from the beginning to the end, all the way into eternity. Nothing corrupt will go with us into the eternal state. Nothing corrupt. All that will be ultimately cleansed. What doesn't what isn't cleansed in this life through growth will be cleansed ultimately before you get to the throne room. So thirdly, phase two cleansing, this second, this Christian life cleansing is a necessary part of transformation, our spiritual growth unto maturity. And this is where you want to go to 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And we'll look at this passage Break it down a bit. Now the promises that he's speaking of, if you'll go back just a few verses to, go back to 14. Don't be bound together with unbelievers. What partnership has righteousness and unrighteousness? What fellowship has light and darkness? What harmony has Christ with Belial or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as just as he has said, I will dwell in them, walk among them, I will be their God, they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst, be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. I will welcome you, I will be a father to you, you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. What a, what a wonderful promise. Now, this is a phase two experiential promise. Positionally, we already have this. In Christ, in our position in Christ, we are already accepted. He is our Father. We are His sons and daughters. We already have it. But He's talking experiential. That's why the command's to come out from them to be separate. These are things that He's trying to accomplish with us, for us, in us, in this life. And part of this, he's going to tell us in verse 1 of chapter 7, is cleansing. Because we have these promises of, of relationship with God. Listen, this is what motivates the Christian. Not fear. Not fear of, of judgment. Not fear of punishment. Not fear. People want to use fear to motivate people. Fear, all fear will do is freeze you. It makes you not do something wrong. It has no ability to inspire you to do something right. It is love for God and His forgiveness that inspires the soul to reach great heights for the Lord, not fear. These promises, he says, therefore, let us cleanse ourselves uh, 
The word cleanse is the word katharizo. It's an aorist active subjunctive, which we'll talk about, hopefully, if I get to it, which means it's potential. The subjunctive mood is potential. Now, do you know what the active voice is? Who produces the action of the verb under the active voice? The subject. Now, who's the subject? Us. We're to do the cleansing. Now, in conjunction with the ministry of the Spirit, never on our own, all of this is under the Spirit. You can't do anything spiritual without the Holy Spirit. So, you've got to be indwelt and filled by the Spirit. But, as we'll talk about shortly, listen, here's the trick. God is not going to decide what we're going to believe. He's not going to do that, decide that for us. All of the stupid stuff that we have believed and put in our heart that we have not gotten rid of, he's not going to make that go away. No amount of prayer, no amount of fasting, no amount of anything is going to just hoof that away. You chose it. You must unchoose it. That's the angelic conflict. That's what the whole thing's about is choices. One of the choices that we have to make is to see what's in us that shouldn't be in us that's not producing godliness and be willing to cleanse it. Now, this is an idea, this is purification. It's And listen, again, I do not think of God as having put upon me a responsibility because I can stay the way I am and God will certainly discipline me as a child, but he will not eliminate me. He will not smoke me. He will not get rid of me. It's an opportunity, folks. God is all about opportunity. He says, come on and go all the way with me. I've got a, I've got a life for you that's just incredible. It's an opportunity. But you've got to let go of this old stuff. I've concluded that letting go of our old stuff may be the hardest part of the Christian life. Might be. I don't know. It seems to be difficult. So he says, cleanse ourselves, cleanse yourself, purify yourself from defilement of flesh and spirit. Now, katharizo is used in four ways to purify. Uh, it means a literal washing of something, a ceremonial ritual washing under the law, it's used for healing diseases like leprosy, and it's used of cleansing old man sinful behavior, either sin in 1 John 1, 9, or cleansing from old man ideas uh, like in Philippians chapter 3. So the mechanics, he says in Ephesians 5, turn to Ephesians 5, 26, and this is pretty important. I mean, how's this going to happen? How's this cleansing happen? Okay. Ephesians 5, 26. Go back to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her. See, cleansing comes before sanctification in, in, in the logical sequence. In reality, they happen at the same time that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. The water is a ceremonial type idea. It's really the washing of the word. The cleansing is part of the ministry of the Spirit through the word of God. We don't know what to cleanse ourselves from without the word or what to exchange it for without the word. Everything's based on the word. So, he says, washing of water by the word. Then he says, if you go, go to Acts 15.9. This is so important. Acts 15.9. Let me show you another way this verb is used. Katharizo, cleansing. Acts 15.9. 
talking about the Gentiles being included. And he says, And God made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now he's talking about the salvation cleansing. But listen to me. That's the same way it works experientially. That's the same way it works after you're saved. It's what we believe that causes cleansing. Believing the right things and not believing the wrong things. So, you can, you can look at these others. The target is the conscience, Hebrews 9.14. This defilement uh, means to, malusmas means to smear with mud or filth has to do with false beliefs related to idolatry in Corinth. Corinth was a big idolatry center. These people that had gotten saved, they had been in idolatry their whole life. And they're adult people, and they get saved, and they come out of this, and they're, they're still, still connected to the idolatry. This is where they had all the conversations about eating meat, sacrificed to idols, and all of that. They had a difficult time disconnecting from this past. This is also the church where the women had taken over. These men were like porn addicts. And whenever men become sexual slaves, enslaved to their own sexual desire, women lose respect for them and dominate them a fact of life they dominate and this is what happened in the Corinthian church since while Paul said women the women in the Corinthian church don't even talk don't even talk he said if you have a question ask your husband at home now did he say that anywhere else never here's what I believe and this is just my belief these ladies had taken over the thing. They had turned the, the worship service into chaotic. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it was chaos. People were just shouting one thing. To everybody wanted to have the gift of tongues. It was crazy. He said, God is not a God of disorder. And he told them how to go about it. And he said, the women, don't talk at all. Don't talk at all. He's trying to break this. And this is why they hated him so bad. They hated this guy because he came in and put the hammer down and said, no more of this. No more. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine? I mean, there's no, it's no wonder to me that he wrote it in a letter and sent it back to him <laughs> when he told the women not to talk. Holy mackerel. He was, he was fearing for his life. So, Cleansing ourselves from defilement of flesh and spirit. Flesh has to do with the lust trends of the, of the flesh, the body. Uh, the sins of the spirit have to do with a polluted belief in behavior system. Perfecting holiness has to do with growth and transformation into a mature believer. So look, on one side, we've got cleansing. On the other side, we've got spiritual growth. We've got the new man side. That's what he means by perfecting or completing holiness, spiritual uh, living uh, according to the measure of the stature of the person of Christ. That's what holiness is. Holiness is living like Christ. It means it's having righteous ideas, righteous manifestations, righteous living. So on the one side, we're cleansing ourselves from defilement. On the other side, we're perfecting holiness. Or we're learning it, we're growing in it, we're developing it, we're practicing it, we're perfecting it. So, Notice the two aspects of growth, the purification of the old and the perfecting of the new. No way to get around it. This is the same uh, in Ephesians. If you'll turn to that passage, Ephesians 4. Twenty. 
22 through 24. You see the two sides. He says, you've been taught in reference to your former way of life, the old self. You lay aside the old self. That's the cleansing, which is being corrupt in accordance with the deceitful desires. That you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's the learning process. And then the perfecting holiness and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness from the truth. So, turn to Hebrews 12.1. You'll notice all of these passages like this have these same two sides to it. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses in chapter 11 surrounding us, let us also lay aside, same word, every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles there's your cleansing. And then let us run with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. There's the perfecting holiness, the new man's side. You could see this 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2, same thing. Uh, so being cleansed from our old way is how we break these patterns that go on and on and on. It's what real growth is. And growth in knowledge and understanding must lead to this growth in purification and perfecting. If we're going to be the real deal, if we're going to be the people that God has called us to be, to be those people, then we can't just learn it and understand it and be able to regurgitate it. We've got to become willing to live it. I've got to become willing to live it. So, oh, the fourth, let's talk about the need for this. Why is there a need for this? Before we do that, let's go to James chapter 1. Let me show you another thing. Just turn on over a couple of pages to James chapter 1. There are some of the things that James got right. This passage 2 through 4, James 1, 2 through 4, consider it pure joy, fellow believers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing or the dokimazo of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result that you might be mature, complete, lacking in nothing. This is a spiritual growth passage. Now, the dokimazo was a test for the purity of gold. And I, I get this from Kenneth Wiest, who was one of the great scholars of words, of Greek words. And he explained the goldsmith. When gold was brought in, out of, dug out of the ground, they would find it, it would be mixed with other metals. They would put it in a crucible and superheat it. The gold being the heaviest of metals would sink to the bottom. The other metals would sink would rise to the surface. The goldsmith would allow the, the slag, the impurities, to come to the top, and he would scoop them off. This is cleansing. He was cleansing the gold, purifying it. That's the process that God has us in. The pressures of our life cause the impurities to boil to the surface. We act upon these old ways of thinking that have nothing to do with God or the Christian life, we find ourselves acting on them. We find ourselves angry, impatient, frustrated, hurtful, saying things we don't need to say, saying things that don't honor Him. We find ourselves being selfish and self-centered and so many things. We find ourselves being hurt and disappointed in our life and allowing that hurt and disappointment to create fear of further hurt. So we we withdraw and protect ourselves. We build a wall around it. We build a fortress, a stronghold. These are all part of what must be purified for, listen, here's the mystery to me. In my body, the Holy Spirit dwells. The, the person who raised Jesus from the dead, okay, dwells in me, has a ministry to my mind. In my soul resides a great deal of Bible doctrine. The 
the truth about God's grace and God's plan. Why aren't those two connecting up together and producing something magnificent? I mean, those two things together ought to be like a spark in gasoline. It ought to be producing a forest fire. Now, that's every one of us. What is, what is hindering that in my life? What is hindering that function from flowing freely through me? I submit to you, it's, it's the fact that I still am preoccupied with old ways of thinking and old ways of believing about happiness and about success and about what will meet my needs. I want to be free of those things. The need for cleansing. Adam's original sin has corrupted us all. We, we didn't get a chance. Listen, it's, it's, uh, it's very confusing to new believers. It was to me. The fact that we inherited Adam's sin, and you never had a chance to do it right. Of course, you understand that you never could have done it right anyway. But Adam's sin has passed down to all of us, Okay. And judicially, that puts us behind the eight ball and in need of a Savior. No matter what your life looked like, you can be the most moral person that ever lived, and still, you're lost and need a Savior. Okay? We understand that. Nothing new here. Romans 5, 12. Sin and death passed down to all mankind. Now, this is spiritual death and physical death. No exceptions. You know, he said, the day you eat the fruit, the day you dying, you will die. That day, they died spiritually. 900-something years later, Adam died physically. So, now, if you'll go back to Ephesians 2, we, we get a picture. Paul gives us a picture of spiritual death and how we operate under spiritual death. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. In this passage, we're going to see spiritual death and the old sin nature. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Okay, you were dead. Now, you're alive, but you're dead. Spiritually dead. Okay, you understand that. Born in Adam's sin under the judgment of 13 judicial charges under the judgment of God and you're spiritually dead, separated from him. And in which you formerly walked as a spiritually dead person according to the course of this world. See, that's the worldly beliefs that are being promoted in the world every day. According to the prince of the... And the world is operating according to the prince of the power of the air, the devil... The Spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh. That's the, that's the, uh, the defilement of the flesh and, the, and of the mind. Lust of the flesh and lust of the mind. And these have to do with our ideas about meeting. See, these lusts are just desires. And... We were indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature, there's your sin nature, children of wrath, even as all the rest of the human race. And then he goes into verse 4, but God being rich in mercy. So, the need for cleansing has first of all to do with the fact that we're born spiritually dead, born under Adam's sin and born spiritually dead. When you're spiritually dead, you're not able to understand anything spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Let's read that. That's pretty important. I mean, if we don't understand this, then we're not going to understand what's happened to us and why we have a problem. He says the natural man... That means the unsaved man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they seem to be foolishness to him and he is unable 
to understand them. Adunamas means not able because they are spiritually discerned or appraised. So the unbeliever who is spiritually dead, separated from God, does not have the capacity because this comes only from the Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can enable us to understand spiritual things. So when you're an unbeliever, or uh, let's say, well, I got saved at five. Well, when were you spiritual at five? See, not only do you have to be saved and have the Spirit, but you have to be spiritual to be able to understand spiritual things. You know, I know lots of people that are saved that spiritual things that I say to them go right over their head. Right over their head. They're not in tune with the Spirit. So when you're not in tune to the Spirit, you don't hear spiritual things. You hear the world. So, spiritual death means we're separated from God and unable to interact with anything spiritual, any spiritual ideas. We are born with an old sin nature, a self-centered nature that causes us to interpret life as is about, it's about me. Life is about me. And boy, is that hard to get rid of. Is that hard to reorient and realize that life is really about God? And I'm just a, I'm just a piece in the machinery all about worshiping and glorifying God. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's hard to get that. That's the sin nature. Listen, not only does it make us just naturally selfish, it causes all of our, the ideas that we develop to be about serving me. My ideas are about me and serving me and protecting me and getting me what I want and need. They're about me, not even about you. Especially not about God. I mean, who's God? You know, if God was any good to me, he'd be, he'd be down here doing something different. He'd be he'd giving me a different life. That's how a lot of people think and feel. Talk to me about God. If God was so great and wonderful, why are all these people suffering all over the world? See, that's the world. That's the devil. You know, if God was so great, he'd let me go and do my own thing. That's the devil's thing. So, we have an, uh, 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 we are born spiritually dead with a sin nature, and out of that, our initial way of thinking is called the old man. That's what Paul calls this old self, this old way of life, which is a self-centered worldly belief system. It's an operating system. It's just a way of thinking. It's a way of looking at life. It's a way of dealing with every aspect of life. It's developed by volition. Listen, here's what's important. We, we develop these ideas, our own ideas, one at a time as life happens. Life happens. Listen, there's a lot of difficulties in life, and there's a lot of wonderful things in life. I mean, our children, certainly they had some hardships, they had some difficulties, but Man, we protected them and provided for them and gave them opportunities and they played sports and they had fun and they did lots of great things. They had a, in my opinion, was a great life. Of course, they see it a little differently. But, look, it didn't protect them from Adam's sin. It didn't protect them from being selfish. It didn't protect them from developing ideas that have nothing to do with God. They're all about me, 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 me. That's what the sin nature does. And these ideas, and th these ideas form a system, and they're developed one at a time as we react to life. They're put on by volition, literally by faith. Something happens in your life, and you immediately ask yourself a question, why did this happen? What does it mean? What does it mean about me? And you're compelled to come up with an answer. 
And you borrow your answer either out of your own mind or you borrow it out of the world or what somebody tells you. When you're spiritually dead, you don't borrow it from God. You can't. So what you, what you pack in your soul comes out of the world. Pure and simple. There's just no other way it could be. There is no other option. So we build this thing. Ideas are believed and put on by faith, by volition, must be removed the same way. They will not fall into disuse or be removed passively. Taking them off must be intentional. Ideas believed become unconscious, habituated patterns forming the subconscious. Listen, you see this in relationships. You see that your relationships have these patterns that they go in, that you have these standard responses to certain things. And I mean, we do this. We go in these circles until we're able to break out of it and stop reacting in certain ways. Does that sound familiar? You have to look for these patterns. You, you observe this behavior. All of a sudden, everything was nice, and now it's not. And you go, what was I thinking and feeling that caused me to say this or in that tone or in that way? What, did, what was that? Certainly wasn't the Holy Spirit. We agree on that. So you got to go, you know, that's not the first time that's, that's happened. That's like the 150,000th time that's happened. This week. So when you see the same thing coming out of you, producing the same result again and again and again, at some point, the Holy Spirit says, stop and look at yourself. Do a self-examination of what were you telling yourself? What were you picturing in your mind that caused you to go there and do that and say that in that way? What was that? Because I assure you, it's an old man belief, pattern, strategy that says, I've got to defend myself. Don't you talk to me that way. Don't you dare do something like that to me. Ah, don't you do that to me. Me, 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 me. Me, me. Me, me. Me. It's about me. See, now what Christ would have done, he would have, he would have asked himself, how can I glorify my Father in this situation? How can I best help that person? in this situation. That's what he would have done because he was pure. All his ideas and beliefs were from the Father. Nothing, nothing, nothing worldly in him. Not, not even one. But that's not us. <laughs> we're full of this stuff. We're full of it. And all the doctrine that you've got, listen, it's not pushed it out. That's what I thought for so long. You get enough, put more and more and more and somehow to just push it off the table. Bible doesn't teach that. Doesn't teach it at all. And that's why it doesn't work. That's why 40 years later, I'm still struggling with the same issues that I was struggling with from day one. Core issues. When an idea is believed and used, it becomes an unconscious habit, forming patterns, part of the subconscious. These unconscious beliefs and patterns continue to influence influence our views about everything. And listen, here's what's, listen to this. These unconscious, habituated ideas lie in wait. They lie in wait for pressure to come into our life. The right pressure comes in the right way from the right direction of the right person, and boom. That's what happened to Paul. That's what happened to Peter. That's so what happened. To, we're going to look at some guys here in a minute. Uh, let me give you this. I don't know if it'll make sense to you. We start out driven by needs. Love, affection, acceptance, accomplishment. These are the things we see in our children. 
Our children come into the world just in full of need, needy. Man, they need. They Listen, without us, and we gladly give them love and affection and a, approval and we keep them clean and safe and we, we, do, we, do, we pour ourselves into them. And listen, they receive it. They're just like sponges. They're just dry and they just, we just pour it. There's no way to fill them up. No way. That's the need. That's what I'm calling need. And as we grow, we use volition to attach our faith to ideas about meeting our needs. For instance, for many, many years, mom and dad are enough, brother and sister. But one day, I noticed this pretty girl, pretty girl, first grade. I sat next to this girl, and I went, wow, she's beautiful. And I began to have another idea. Okay, right? I began to believe something else or someone else. Sorry, Mom, you've been replaced, <laughs> you know? No, not really, but. So we use our volition to attach our faith to ideas that fulfill our needs. And listen, for our, our protect ourselves from disappointment and pain. If you've had a tough life, or as you develop and you're early and everything's going tough for you, then you're trying to protect yourself. Especially if you've been violated or hurt, or in some way you learn to avoid situations. Or you go within yourself and build a stronghold and you pretend that it doesn't hurt. Lots of different ways the mind finds to protect us from being hurt. Listen, these are the very things that protected us as, as young people that later on in life will hinder us from being able to fully give ourselves to the Lord because we hold back. We hold back. And it's just instinct. Listen, you don't, you don't know you're building this. It's instinct. It's sin nature instinct to make yourself the center and say, look, I, know, I can't let that happen again. I call them naps, never again policies. How many of those do you have in your life where you tell yourself, I will never let that happen again? I will never let myself care that much about anyone or any situation so that I can be hurt like that again. You see, that's called a stronghold. It's a defensive position. Paul said those got to have to be torn down. You grow up in a really tough, uh, dour, serious environment, and you're just, you don't know how to have fun in your life. Everything's serious. That, that was kind of me, but... Our personal sins come out of these ideas. You have a desire, your body has a desire. So you tell yourself, or you ask yourself, wow, what can I do to meet that? You know, you start with hunger, you know, for food. You go, boy, that really tasted good. And now you're no longer physically hungry, but you're hungry for the taste. You're hungry for the experience. For the pleasure. So you have another round. And another round. Before you know it, you weigh 2,000 pounds. So, and then your knees go out and you can't run anymore or walk very much. And now you can't get in your britches. And now you, it's just a cycle. It might be. I might be. <laughs> Paul, listen, Paul had a normal hunger for recognition and approval in his life. He took that hunger for approval and he attached it to success. 
He believed that success in the eyes of others would, would satiate that hunger. Truth is, the only thing that will satiate the hunger in the heart of a human being is God. But we attach, by faith, these hungers, these needs, these desires to all types of things out of the world. All the time. We've done it our whole life. Peter did the same thing. He had a hunger to belong, to be accepted by Jesus for his love and loyalty. That's why when Jesus said, Peter, are you committed to me? He said, Lord, you know that you're, we're, I'm your best friend. Jesus is like, Peter, I'm not looking for a best friend, man. I'm looking for some committed ministers. Anyway, this is the old man. And I think that we've all maybe accepted the fact that it does exist and the question is, what do we do about it? And I want to read the Bible. Let's look at some examples of how specific believers, great believers, some of them, allowed these things to stay in their heart and it became a fatal flaw. Like the Exodus generation, God told them that when they went into the land, they were to destroy, just like he told Saul, Go kill, go kill King Agish, I think that was his name, and kill everything. Every man, woman, child, animal, dog, cat. Burn down the houses and burn the fields. Don't bring anything back. They didn't do that. Everything that was good and fruitful they kept in disobedience. That's what the Exodus generation did. God said, when you go in, Listen, and, and listen, it's not God is an evil, violent person. He was cleansing the land from the evil of these idolatrous people. That was the point. They refused to do it. They made treaties with all types of these people. And these people became the thorn in their side all through Israel's history. Those evils that they left in their life came back to bite them. You got Jacob. Jacob's a chip off the old block. His, listen, if you go back to Abraham, you can see that Abraham was more loyal to his earthly father than he was to God. Now, I know this is a matter of growth. It's all about a matter of growth. All this is about growth. These things that are in us that shouldn't be, as we grow, we throw them aside and we replace them. I call it erase and replace. But Abraham passes down this family loyalty, this blood is thicker than water, to Isaac. And, he, and, he, and he, Isaac marries Rebekah, who comes out of Abraham's people. They all have got this family loyalty thing. And it's a great thing in a right context, in a right way. But they've got this problem with favoritism. Isaac loves Esau. And Rebecca loves Jacob. They fa had their favorites. Well, what does Jacob do? He had the same thing. Passed right on down. He picked it right up and took it on. And listen, this stuff passes down genetically. Where you inherit the genetic tendencies, the sinful weaknesses, the weaknesses of the sin nature from your family, from your blood. I believe it. Because when you have kids, you see they come out the way they are. I mean, they are the way they are. They, now, they grow and learn and change, but, you know, my first one came out as stubborn as, I know it comes from Rhonda's side of the family, of course, but, yeah, anyway. So, look, we see Jacob. Here's, here's, what's ter here's what's so bad about Jacob's life. And look, God took this and turned it into a blessing. He always does. He'll take it all and turn it into your great blessing. But look what he did to his family. Look at the suffering and the misery that the other kids went through. And Joseph and Benjamin. Look at the wives that he took that he didn't love and didn't want because he was so 
preoccupied with Rachel. He was so in love with love. What an idiot. Look, Jacob desperately needed to get rid of that stuff from his soul. Desperately. How about David? Boy, let me tell you, David had a weakness for women. Well, <laughs> either that or other men now. I mean, it's who knows what. But, yeah, all men have a weakness for, we're design, men are designed to love and to have a partner and to have somebody be part of their life. They can't, they're not, they're not, whole without that. You ladies that are more powerful than you have even imagined what you could make a man into. It's incredible. But David, look, he marries Michael. Of course, you, here's the deal about David. You never know who his mother is. She's only mentioned once. And that's in passing. He's in the field with the, with the sheep early in his life, early. I mean, he's like 9, 10, 11. This kid's not in home with his family. He's out by himself. So there's this ache in him, this hunger in him for connection and love and intimacy. And he marries Michael, who is taken from him and given to somebody else. Of course, you know the first thing he did when he became king of Israel? He went and got her. She's already gone and built another family and has another life. And it was a terrible thing to do. And it probably had to do with more with the fact that she had been married to him and he couldn't allow her. Somebody could have used her to claim the throne. So it was more than just the fact that he wanted her back because he never touched her. They had no relation whatsoever. She hated him. She despised him. She originally loved him, but so David's got, look, he meets this lady. He marries one lady, I can't remember, and then he get, meets Abigail, yeah. marries her, you know, and I mean, everywhere he goes, look, David, don't look at the women. You'll marry one of them, you know. Uh, I got a friend like that. I couldn't stop. It was like he got on a roll. And uh, anyway, uh he tried to fill the emptiness in his heart through sex and love. He's got eight wives when he sees Bathsheba. Eight. And other and listen, concubines. Concubines were mistresses. David didn't have he had no trouble finding a sex partner. None at all. Eight wives. And then he sees Bathsheba and gotta have her. Now, do you think that, that whatever that was in him? that made him vulnerable to that? You think it would have been a good thing to go through some time out alone with the Lord and some self-examination to rip that thing out and throw it away? That would have been real good before Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite and all of the things that went on. Golly. <coughs> destroyed, about destroyed him. How about, how about Moses? Greatest man maybe in the whole that ever lived. Said God, God said, I speak to him like a man speaks to his friend. Wow. But he finally had enough of the, Israel, uh, the Exodus generation. God said, speak to the rock. Prayer. He said, no, I'm going to strike the rock. He says, why do Aaron and I, why do we have to give you water? Thought. How is it you're doing it anyway, Moses? He got caught up and been nice if he had, and he didn't get to the land. That'd been, that was kind of disappointing, wasn't it? <laughs> Jeez. Hey, here's the point. Do you want to get to the land? You bet you, you do. That's the analogy God has given us for our Christian life, to cleanse the land. The land is your heart. So, you could go on. Old man beliefs must be intentionally observed and removed. I call it erase and replace. There's a passage. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. 
all of these passages, all these verbs for removing or cleansing are either active or middle voice. Most of them middle voice. And the middle voice says this, the subject acts upon himself. Okay? Under the ministry of the Spirit, the subject acts upon self. So you look at yourself, you observe these patterns, and you interrupt them and get rid of them. You break them. You remove them, and you replace them. All of these passages, and look, these are just a few. There's so many more. The Spirit is the supernatural power enabling the believer to process spiritual things. There's no life without the Spirit. There's none of this without Him. He gives us the wisdom to understand the truth and the power to choose for it. But He will not decide what you're going to believe or what ideas you're going to apply in your life. He's not going to do that. He's not going to do it. You can ask him all you want. God, take this out of me. Take this away. Take this desire out of my heart. He's going to say no. I'm going to explain to you what that desire is. See, desire, nothing wrong with desire. It's just what you attach it to. No such thing as a wrong desire. It's a desire gone run amok attached to the wrong thing. The Spirit will empower us to observe and remove old man beliefs, but he will not choose for us. The beliefs we hold in our hearts and use to live are the key to our place in the angelic conflict. Cleansing and removing false beliefs and strategies are an important part of spiritual growth. The reason I've stayed on this for so long is that it is the key it's the key to the application part of the Christian life. It's the key to it. Once you put an idea in your heart, it will remain there and influence you until you remove it. So let's, uh, let's go to the Lord. Father, what a great privilege to be part of this. I pray that this makes sense and that it inspires us as we observe these other believers and watch their, that they, they held on to these fatal flaws that the Apostle Paul, the, the greatest believer in the New Testament, in the, in the New Covenant, is still vulnerable, no matter, even in spite of what he knows of having spent time with you, Lord. He's this ambition to be met in a specific way in, by the Jews and by others, the leaders, to be part of all that was just, he attached his hunger to that. And it wasn't until he ended up in jail in Rome that he realized he had to remove it. And the story of Philippians 3 is that's that story. And I just pray that we can come to see this in our own life and, and make these changes so that we can be more and more like Christ every day we live. And I thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen.